We were once like all the other animals that inhabit the earth. We too were hunters and gatherers, moving across the land to feed on the grains, the grasses, the berries and fruits, wherever and whenever we found them. Then we discovered we could plant the seeds and grow our own food. And everything changed. Over many years, our methods of agriculture have become ever more mechanized and more complex. At the same time, we've lost millions of acres of good land to pollution, erosion, and an ever-growing population. Now, people all over the world are working to help change our perceptions about how we grow our food and how we treat the land. People such as John Jevons of Ecology Action, Wes Jackson of the Land Institute, Alice Waters, internationally known chef and owner of Chez Panisse Restaurant, and organic farmer Mas Masumoto. Together, they are telling a new story of the living land. On a hillside in Northern California, John Jevons grows his test plots and conducts research. His book, How to Grow More Vegetables Than You Ever Thought Possible on Less Land Than You Can Imagine, has been translated into seven languages and is used in more than 110 countries throughout the world. A thing which has increased my excitement and interest in doing this kind of work is the fact that uh, there's only probably about 45 years worth of soil left on this planet, farmable soil. There's a lot of other kinds of soil here. And each time in the United States that we eat a pound of food, approximately six pounds of soil are lost through wind and water erosion. Now, in, in a larger scale, what does this mean? Each one of us eats 2,000 pounds of food a year. So that means that six times 2,000 six tons of soil are lost per person per year in the United States given the types of agricultural practices that we're pursuing. A California state study in the 1970s showed that it takes 2,000 years to build up one inch of topsoil but that California agriculture was depleting one inch every 25 years. When we plow the soil it loosens it up it tends to destroy the structure of the soil and so when wind comes along, it can lift up and blow away. The reason that I got started with this small-scale farming is I wanted to know what was the smallest area that one person could raise all their food in an environmentally sound way that would also be equitable so that if everyone in the world used this or a similarly effective technique, there'd be enough resources for everyone to live well. Jevons stresses that several important steps are required for biointensive agriculture. We prepare the soil about two feet deep. Normally in agriculture, it's only prepared about seven inches deep. So what we do is we have air penetrating the soil more deeply so that the aerobic microbes produce beneficial things for uh, crop growth. Uh, they can be deeper in the soil. Secondly, we use compost. Most people in the world are not focusing on uh, this issue of growing all of their own compost crops. Instead, they're bringing them in from the outside in the form of wheat stubble, corn stalks, manures, but that's actually depleting someone else's soil. So we need to become responsible for our own soil fertility. The third element is close plant spacing, the deep soil preparation and the uh, Nutrient-rich compost enable you to have up to four times the plants per unit of area. And the yields per plant can be just as high as if you had them further apart and in rows. The fourth element is, is a thing that's called um, sort of plant synergy or companion planting. Certain crops do better when they're grown together than when they're grown separately. Uh, one that you could try in your backyard is if you like bib lettuce and you want to have the best uh, flavor in your bib lettuce, you put in one spinach plant for every four bib lettuce plants and you get better flavor. When we first began doing this work many years ago, uh, people thought putting all these plants really close together was uh, pretty crazy. But then when they saw the yields and the, the tasty productivity, um, they 
began to increasingly appreciate uh, biologically intensive food raising practices and using them and enjoying them uh, in their backyards. And even for the production of money, you can produce a lot of money in a very small scale area by growing vegetables uh, for urban markets. For a person who's just starting to garden, we have a, a book out called The Sustainable Vegetable Garden. You can begin with one of these one bed units. It's 100 square feet. It's only four feet by 25 feet or five feet by 20 feet and you can learn how to grow all the crops you'll ever have to know how to grow for your region and for your dietary preferences. What we need to do is develop forms of agriculture, not just biointensive, lots of thriving forms that have the capacity to build the soil while producing high yields and using less resources. There's only one person in the United States out of 500 that farms. So not only are we losing our soil base, we're losing our skill base. And if you look at different countries around the world, they're following suit to where there's very few farmers left. The Chinese call their farmers living libraries because they don't just know what they read in a book, they have millennia of experience behind them. So our message is directed not just to people who are raising food now, but to people everywhere so they can learn out how to grow soil and how to grow food in a really small area so we all can be part of the solution. If you grow a healthy soil, you're gonna grow healthy plants and then you're gonna grow healthy people. It's, it's, it's wonderful, it's a symbiotic relationship. While John Jevons directs his efforts toward helping the individual vegetable grower or small-scale farmer, a different project has been underway in the Midwest. Wes Jackson was born and raised on the Great Plains of Kansas and holds degrees in both botany and genetics. As president of the Land Institute in Salina, for more than 20 years, he has been developing a revolutionary concept called natural systems agriculture. We are particularly looking at what we call the problem of agriculture rather than problems in agriculture. In the early part of the agricultural revolution, it was soil erosion and soil salting. Uh, in the industrial era, it's fossil fuel dependency and uh, chemical contamination of the countryside. When we took on the problem of agriculture, the first thing we did was look to nature's ecosystems that run on uh, contemporary sunlight and feature material recycling. Humans are fundamentally grass seed eaters. In one form or another, between 70 to 80 percent of our calories come from the grass family. Jackson's Land Institute was in a prime position to discover how the native prairie is able to sustain itself. Here's what you find on that prairie. You find four functional groups. And by the way, it's interesting. It doesn't matter whether you're in Saskatchewan or whether you're in Texas. If you're in prairie, you're going to have those four functional groups. Warm season grasses, cool season grasses, legumes, and members of the sunflower family. Uh, there are other species out there, other plant families besides those four, but those are the four biggies. If you compare that never plowed native prairie, say, to a wheat field, it is um, a wheat field features annuals grown in a monoculture where there's soil erosion, fossil fuel dependency for both nitrogen fertility and for traction. Uh, and uh, on the other hand, there's that prairie on sloping ground that features species diversity instead of a monoculture. So the question becomes, you know, here's the prairie doing everything it needs to do uh, for us and for itself and for the planet, uh, except it doesn't produce grains. So can we tweak it in some way? to produce grains. According to Jackson, there were four basic biological questions that needed to be addressed. First, can perennial grains increase yields at no trade-off cost to the plant? Second, can perennial species yield more when planted in combination with other species than when planted alone? Third, 
Can a perennial polyculture manage weeds and avoid epidemics of pests and plant diseases? And fourth, can such an ecosystem provide its own nitrogen fertility needs? Research to date has answered the first three questions positively. Uh, the fourth question as to whether the system can sponsor enough of its own nitrogen, uh, that's not definitive. We have data that's suggestive, but uh, not uh, conclusive. We're saying that in a course of, say, a quarter century, with adequate funding, we could have a fundamentally different agriculture beginning to appear on the American landscape that would be as different from what we have, say, as the airplane is from the train. It's going to take a combination of ecologists, plant ecologists, soil ecologists, insect ecologists, microbial ecologists, um, environmental historian, um, landscape ecologists, um, plant breeders, plant breeders that will be uh, domesticating wild species candidates and plant breeders that will be perennializing the major crops, the corn, the wheat, the sorghum, and so on. Part of our agenda for the next century has to be to make soil health and human health one subject. Part of the modern problem is that uh, we treat soil like dirt. And um, uh, so there's that kind of a spiritual danger there <laughs> that um, uh, we don't recognize it as the source. I think that it's very important for people to understand source. Um, Aldo Leopold said that there are two spiritual dangers that come from uh, not having a farm. He could have said growing up on a farm. One is the belief that heat comes from a stove and the other that food comes from a grocery store. When I was a kid growing up on a farm here in Kansas in the Kansas River Valley near Topeka, I learned more in the first 18 years uh, of life on that farm than I learned uh, getting an undergraduate degree and a PhD in a land-grant institution. I mean, I, I may be a geneticist, I may be a botanist, but you know, that sort of formal education versus what the land taught me and a culture taught me, you know, is minuscule. Jackson believes that in order to solve the fundamental problem of agriculture, certain questions are critically important. What was here? What will nature require of us here? What will nature help us to do here? That question, what will you allow us to do here, is very different than the question, what can we get away with? What can we get away with is the child's question. Uh, the other one is the mature and moral adult question. And that difference is crucial. <laughs>